Hey, my name is Elliot. I'd like to welcome you back to our afternoon sessions for the Heroes Journey Entrepreneurship Festival. Thanks to all the morning panelists for such a wonderful time. Uh, we're going to kick it off with a fun panel here. And uh, throughout organizing this whole event, I felt a bit like Tom Sawyer painting the fence. Because this was going to be my panel, and people emailed, and I got a great email from Saro Morong, who's an economist. And he's saying, you know, I've been writing all these papers, doing this research ever since I went to an IHS seminar back in 91, 92, was it? 89. Back in 89. And uh, so he got interested in the whole aspect of the, basically the hero, the entrepreneur as the lone hero, the creative destroyer uh, from Joseph Schumpeter. And we have the quote up here, the stock exchange is a poor substitute for the holy grail, which is definitely a good way to teach and inspire entrepreneurship, that you're not working for the bottom line as opposed to the higher ideals. Anyways, uh, so he kind of did half my job in kind of giving a much more intellectual backbone to the site from an economic standpoint because his paper, which he'll talk about a little bit, actually goes in depth and sums up, he's done a lot of research on all different economists, their views on what the entrepreneur is. And that's actually a place that's lacking in the whole field of uh, economics, is the study of entrepreneurship, which is kind of odd because entrepreneurship is the fount of so much of the wealth that economists do end up studying. But there's various reasons for that, he'll comment on them. And then there's a book for sale outside. Uh, and we have one of the authors here, we're quite honored, Carol S. Sampson. And the back of the book says, it's about the spirit, it's called The Spirit of Entrepreneurship. And the back of it says, personal stories of 60 entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial executives from Europe and North America are studied in the context of human and organizational behavior. So that whole word story keeps showing up again and again. Case studies range from solo entrepreneurs to fast growing ventures and from entrepreneurial CEOs to creative leaders in the public sector. So again, it's that whole thing that uh, entrepreneurship spans a full spectrum, and that so often it is uh, not looking at it as like one just unique uh, type of person that does it. Okay, can you hear me okay? I don't talk into a microphone a lot. I teach small classes, about 25 to 30 students, and we're in a much smaller room. Uh, as Elliot said, I'm a, an economist. I have a PhD in economics, and I'm probably the only economics professor in the room, right? Economics is called the dismal science, so everyone's been so upbeat and optimistic today, I think we need a dose of being dismal. So some, someone's got to come in here and put a damper on things, or we'll, we'll kind of fly off the handle. Uh, an article I wrote, uh, Nicole is going to pass it out, it's an article that kind of summarizes what I'm going to be talking about, it's the one I wrote in 1992. I call my little talk here today, Who Says Entrepreneurs Are Heroes? Well, it turns out a lot of people are saying it, and a lot of people who really know what they're talking about are saying it. So I'm going to try to briefly do three things. Talk about how I got interested in this, Elliot alluded to it, and then go over my, briefly my major findings, and then just go through one by one who are some of these other people that are coming up with this idea of saying that entrepreneurs are heroes. Well, whoops. We had a panel this morning made up of people from the Institute for Humane Studies. And in 1989, I attended a seminar that they put on. And one of the required readings was by an economist named Israel Kirzner. And in one of his books, he said something like, entrepreneurs discover opportunities for economic profit by leading lives of purposeful action. OK, well, as a graduate student in economics, they never really taught us about what purposeful action might be. And that sounded like following your bliss, because the Power of Myth series with Bill Myers and Joseph Campbell had been on just the previous year. Well, over the next few years, I developed the idea. I wrote this short article that's going around. And I wrote a longer paper, which is on my website, called The Creative Destroyers. Maybe you'll understand why I called it that in, in, in a little bit. OK, so let's see. I'm ready to do my PowerPoint. So, oh, you're ready? You're on. I'm on. OK. OK, so this gets into my first point. I'm going to talk about three similarities between entrepreneurs and heroes. My, I guess I'll call those my major findings. And I've already mentioned what uh, Kirzner said. And I've got some quotes there from, from Joseph Campbell uh, that summarizes following your bliss. He talked about following your bliss a lot. So there, you know, it's not just any one quote from Campbell. Uh, he said, if, if the work you're doing is the work uh, whoops. The work you're doing is the work that you choose to do because you are enjoying it, that's it. Each incarnation has a potentiality. 
and the mission of life is to live that potentiality. That's the kind of thing that made me think that Kersner was saying the same thing, but about entrepreneurs. Okay, now the next slide is a quote from the book, The Hero of the Thousand Faces. So this gets into my second parallel between entrepreneurs and heroes. Oops, let me, okay. And like I said, this is from The Hero of the Thousand Faces. The standard path of the mythological adventure of the hero is a magnification of the formula represented in the rites of passage, separation, initiation, return, which might be named the nuclear unit of the monomyth. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. Well, how does this work for the entrepreneur? And this is a little bit of a clip from the article that you have. The entrepreneur must step out of the ordinary way of producing and into his or her imagination about the way things could be to discover the previously undreamt of technique or product. The fabulous forces might be applying the assembly line technique or interchangeable parts to producing automobiles or building microcomputers in a garage. The mysterious adventure is the time spent tinkering in research and development, but once those techniques are discovered or developed, the entrepreneur now has the power to bestow this boon on the rest of mankind. So that's a second similarity. Following your bliss is one similarity between the entrepreneur and the hero. This going through this separation, initiation, return is, is, a, is a second similarity. Entrepreneurs have to separate themselves from the their normal world and go discover some, some better way to do things and then come back, bring it back to the marketplace. The third similarity, when I read The Hero of the Thousand Faces for the second time, I actually noticed this. Joseph Schumpeter, the famous economist that Elliot mentioned in his book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, talked about the incessant creative destruction in a capitalist economy to describe what entrepreneurs do. Well, then I'm reading The Hero of the Thousand Faces again, and I see that ha Campbell says, refers to something called the cosmogenic cycle, which unrolls the great vision of the creation and destruction of the world, which is vouchsafed as revelation to the su successful hero. For example, Henry Ford destroys the horse and buggy age, but creates the automobile age. So that really amazed me. It was probably the most amazing thing I came across in, in studying these comparisons. The Hero of the Thousand Faces and Schumpeter's book, they both came out in the 1940s. And I'm not sure if anyone ever saw that uh, similarity before, although people certainly for a long time have talked about the entrepreneur as hero. Well, now who else says that entrepreneurs are heroes? Okay. Yep. A little behind me in my slide. The first people that we're going to look at are Candace Allen Smith and Dwight Lee. Uh, Candace Allen Smith has won numerous teaching awards and she's been a high school teacher. And someone mentioned Vernon Smith earlier, a Nobel Prize winner in economics at George Mason University. She's married to Vernon Smith, and she works with him at their Institute for Experimental Economics. And then uh, she co-authored an article with Dwight Lee, and he's a professor of private enterprise at the University of Georgia. He's a very well-known economist, has published many articles and books. And they wrote an article in 1996 called The Entrepreneur's Hero, which won the Best Paper Award. And just to try to summarize what I thought was maybe the main point of their article, my, my opinion, they said, just as, society that, as the society that doesn't venerate winners of races will produce fewer champion runners than the society that does, the society that does not honor entrepreneurial accomplishment will find fewer people of ability engaged in wealth creation than the society that does. And then uh, Candace Allen was invited to give a speech on this at the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas. And this is, this is what economics is all about, the Federal Reserve Board. And they wanted to hear this message of entrepreneurs being heroes. And in that speech, she used the separation, initiation, return from, from Campbell to describe what the hero does. And then this, she, her article, her speech was published by the Fed in their Insights newsletter. And then the Independent Review and the Freeman, uh, those two other publications, reprinted that. And we move to 2001, uh, Narayana N.R. Murthy, who's the chairman and CEO of Infosys, he gave the commencement address in 2001 at Wharton to the MBA graduates. And well, what did he tell them? What was the last thing he told them? What do you want to guess? Oh, come on. Follow your bliss. Wow, you guys are clairvoyant. He talked, to, the last, this is the last paragraph from his speech. He talked about, oh, Bill Moyers and the 
Power of Myth series with Joseph Campbell. And the very last thing he says, but always without fail, ensure that you are following your bliss. And this is a successful entrepreneur giving advice to, to future entrepreneurs. The next person is uh, James Cousas, who is the author of The Leadership Challenge, How to Get Extraordinary Things Done in Organizations. He has served as director of the Executive Development Center of the University of Santa Clara. He's also an executive fellow Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, Levy School of Business. Now, I'm going to have a quote from him, and it was from a television show called Thinking Aloud with Jeffrey Mishlov. Has anyone ever seen that show? Excellent show. I think he had Joseph Campbell on it one time. And he talks about what he's done working with entrepreneurs, that Campbell's idea of a vision quest really describes what the entrepreneurs do. And uh, at the end of the, the quote, he says, I think there's a perfect connection between what Campbell is saying about mythology and what we and others are discovering about leadership. And of course, he, earlier he says that the entrepreneur is one of the new heroes in the world, one of the new mythical heroes. This is clearly somebody that knows what he's talking about because he, he works with entrepreneurs. I don't know the date of when uh, he was interviewed by Jeffrey Mitchell. Uh, the next person is Jerry Osterjung, executive director uh, of the Jim Moran Institute for Global Entrepreneurship. He's a professor of finance, a professor of entrepreneurship. He's worked with over 3,000 entrepreneurs. He's written a column uh, for entrepreneurs in the newspaper. And what did he say? On his blog page, he wrote a blog entry a couple years ago, not quite two years ago, which is called Follow Your Bliss. Okay? And he goes on and talks about how you're not going to be successful if you are in it for the money, but you have to follow your passion. Okay? So, again, everybody I'm talking about so far, these are, are, are not people that are just, you know, uh, dabbling in this. These people really know what they're talking about. They have good academic backgrounds, serious scholars. Then Walter Williams, who's a professor at George Mason University, that came up earlier today, and he gave a speech at Hillsdale College called The Entrepreneur's American Hero, and he said, uh, to me the most telling thing he said was, for the most part in a free society, people who are wealthy have become so through effectively serving their fellow man. That is the only way to make a profit. Okay, he didn't get into Joseph Campbell or mythology, but he did say that what entrepreneurs do is, is pretty much the most important thing. Now we have Johann Norberg, and he's written several books, uh, Defense of Global Capitalism, which has won numerous awards recently, and he got invited to give a speech at Cato. So what did he talk about? Well, his talk was about the entrepreneur as hero, and who did he quote? Joseph Campbell. Okay, so here's someone who clearly knows a lot about economics and what goes on in the economy today, and bottom line for him was that entrepreneurs are heroes in the Joseph Campbell sense. Then uh, Kenneth Kukier, he is a technology correspondent, and there was something called the uh, Rushlikan Conference on Information Policy, and they decided to title their report, Innovative Entrepreneurship and Public Policy, and they named it after the hero of the thousand faces. Now, they begin with a quote from Joseph Campbell, where you study, where, where you stumble, there your treasure lies. And then in one part of the uh, report it says, tacit knowledge is communicated, the one way tacit knowledge is communicated is through narrative and myth. So again, they're, they're getting back to stories and myth, everything that we've been talking about here today. The timeless lessons of literature and art. And then it goes on and mentions that, well, what were they going to do about it? Well, they were going to hire a storyteller, a journalist as a professional storyteller, and they made a point to name this book after Joseph Campbell's book. And then James Currier, who founded the internet company Tickle, he was re uh, report, quoted in the San Francisco Chronicle, saying uh, about starting a business as an adventure, it can build your character as you build the business in that Joseph Campbell, the hero of a thousand fa faces kind of way. And then last October, getting finally back to an economist, somebody who might know what he's talking about, he's a Nobel Prize winner, maybe you've heard of Edmund Phelps. This was his article. This was his article called Dynamic Capitalism, written right after the announcement that he won the Nobel Prize. And I know how Elliot McGuckin likes the classics and Aristotle. Well, he quoted Aristotle. Uh, he said using what he called an, an Aristotelian perspective on the development of talents, Rawlsian justice requires that entrepreneurs be accorded enough opportunity to raise their self-realization scores. And then he also said it would be a non sequitur to give up on private entrepreneurs and financiers as the wellspring of dynamism merely because the fruits of their dynamism would likely be less than they could be in a less imperfect system. I conclude that capitalism is justified normally by the expectable benefits to the lowest paid workers, but failing that by the injustice of depriving entrepreneurial types as well as other creative people 
of opportunities for their self-expression. I don't think that's a big leap to say self-expression, self-realization. That's very similar to what Campbell is talking about in terms of, of following your bliss. And again, this is a Nobel Prize winning economist, okay, and, and he's talking about it in the context of entrepreneurship. Now, there's one more expert to hear from. We're going to listen to a, a short clip from a radio interview he did, and the man, someone is inter interviewing him. And you may have heard of the, this author as we listen to it, but th this person also has something to say, so I think you might want to listen to that. In, in a sense, the, it's, it's the going for the, uh, the jumping over the edge and, and moving into the adventure that really uh, catalyzes the creativity, isn't it? I would say so. You don't have creativity otherwise. Otherwise, there's no fire. You're just following somebody else's rules. Well, my wife is a dancer, you know, and she has had dance companies for, for many, many years. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know whether I should talk about this, but when the young people are really adventuring it, it's amazing how much, what guts they have and, and what uh, meager lives they can be living, you know, and yet the richness of the uh, action in the studio. Then you're going to have a, a concert season. They all have to join a union. And as soon as they join the union, their character changes. There are certain rules of how many hours a day you can rehearse. There are certain rules of how many weeks uh, of rehearsing. They bring this down like, uh, like a sledgehammer on the whole thing. And, and there are two mentalities. There's the mentality of security, of money, and there's the mentality of the open risk, you know? In other societies, we can look and see that uh, there are other societies, cultures, that honor elders. In our society, it seems like m much the elders are part of the mainstream, and there's a continual kind of wanting to turn away from uh, what the elders have to say, the way it is, the way to do it. And the union example is a typical one where the authority institution, namely the union, comes in and says, this is the way it's done. And then one has to fall into line or one has to find something else to do. That's right. And um, it's like created this dichotomy between the elders and the sons and daughters of the elders. And how do you see that in relationship to other cultures? Well, I... Uh, th this business of the what this comes to is the conflict of the art, creative art, and economic security. And I don't think I've seen it in other cultures. Um, the artist doesn't have to buck against quite the odds that he has to buck against today. The artist is honored in he other cultures. He is honored. Yes, and quickly honored. Uh, here, uh, it's a struggle yeah. with non-profit <laughs> yeah, organizations time, yeah. and the, the whole route of the or struggle. Or you might just hit it off, something that uh, really strikes the need and, uh, and requirements of the, of the day, and, and then you've given your gift early, you know. But uh, basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a real risk. And I think that's so in any adventure, even in, in, in business, the man who has the idea of, of a new kind of uh, gift to, to society, you know, that, and he's willing to risk it. <clears throat> and then the workers come in and claim that they're the ones that did it, you know, and uh, he can't afford even to perform his performance. It's, it's, a, it's a grotesque conflict, I think, between the security and the creativity ideas. The entrepreneur is a creator. He's running a risk. Maybe in an in a, in American uh, capitalistic society, the entrepreneur is the, the creative hero in some sense. Oh, well, I think he is. I mean, the real one. Uh, most people go into uh, economic activities, not for risk, but for security. <laughs> Do yes. you see what I mean? And sure. the other psychology tends to take over. I'm speaking with Joseph Campbell. We're going to continue our... Campbell. Some of you did? Okay. Well, if, if you didn't recognize the voice, that, that was, uh, first of all, Michael Toms, who has a radio show called New Dimensions at KQED in San Francisco, uh, the radio station, 
And of course, that's Joseph Campbell. People have been talking about him all day long, the author of The Hero of a Thousand Faces. If you don't know, he died in uh, 1987. I don't have an exact date for this tape. It must have been between 1972 or three and 1987. Some of the tapes are still available through uh, New Dimensions. I have several tapes, several hours worth of conversations between Campbell and Toms, and I think this was the last one I listened to. I'd been through all of them, and I remember I was driving on the road in rural Arkansas, and I had the tape playing in my car. I'd already been doing the entrepreneurship research for a couple of years, and I had no idea Joseph Campbell had ever uh, talked about this. Uh, one, one last thing, I have a website that I call The Relationship Between Economics and Mythology. If you come across any books or articles that relate economics to mythology, send me an email, and I can post a link to that, because I'm trying to get a a central place where anybody can go and see what's being done in terms of relating economics to mythology. Thank you. Thank you, Cyril. Cyril found me on the web. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say a few things and then maybe um, have you join me. Uh, you know, um, I had the enormous fortune of meeting uh, Bob and his wife, Sandra, and of being in the jury where we found this fortune for the guy. barrier that we don't need. Is that better? So I had the enormous fortune to meet him, uh, or even better, technology. Is it on? This is not on. Does it work? Well, oh. Okay. Oh. Well, so um, that was the story about uh, Joseph Campbell, very impressive person. Um, I want to talk a little bit, um, not so much about Joseph Campbell, or uh, I, I want to do it through the stories, uh, my own story partially and stories of other people. Um, and, and quickly, you know, I, I came to this happy land about 40 years ago um, and lived all over the world and spent half my career in... Uh, in, as an executive as, and as an, uh, an entrepreneur in the biomedical uh, realm and wrote a book about that called Scientists as Entrepreneurs in which I quoted Joseph Campbell. Uh, and that's probably how you found me or maybe the other book. Um, and then uh, I decided that that wasn't my bliss anymore. Um, it was just too automatic for me. And so I became, uh, after the entrepreneurship thing, I became an academic. And uh, I've done this now since 1990. Uh, and I'm at the point now where I told one of my academic colleagues here today, where I have put myself into 100% variable uh, professorship. So I only work when I make money and I only make money when I work. So I have no, ten well, I do have tenure, they can't fire me, but if I want to work 5%, I can do that, and if I want to work 100%, I do that. So what I now do is I visit mostly other universities and talk about stuff that Elliot invited me here, here for. Um, so my book, my recent book is um, uh, um, about entrepreneurship, the spirit of entrepreneurship. Uh, these are 60 stories of people in North America and, and Europe who uh, took this upon themselves to uh, defy all the odds, um, and, it's, and it's their stories. The other, the other story of it is, is, has to do with the fact that um, community, economy, and ecology are drifting apart, as we hear, hear every day. And my thesis is that 
these three entities are supreme grounds for entrepreneurship. Uh, that there's lots of opportunities in the ecological entrepreneurship or, or, or in ecological economics uh, on the very presumption that uh, the first two words that I mentioned have the same three first letters. Who knows what eco means? Life? Well, boils down to it. Eco? It, it actually means earth. So... Um, so one, so eco is a, is a Greek word, and one, uh, ecology, therefore, is the, the knowledge, the science of the world, of the earth, and economy is basically the management of the earth. When the two start to separate, what will happen? Or to put it more succinctly, when economy is going to exceed the physical limitations of Mother Earth, what is going to happen? Sorry? Yeah, what or desire, but, but it's, it's much more subtle than that. It can be much more. But in essence, what happens is we are polluting ourselves when that happens, or we're polluting our children, and I have grandchildren, so that doesn't feel too good either. So I'm not an eco-warrior in the ecological sense. I'm an ecology-economy warrior in that sense. Um, and that's totally also, uh, you know, totally compatible with the whole um, issue of living your bliss. Uh, because if you see the consequences of what happens, and then on the other hand you see, go on the web and look at sustainable business ventures, you'll find hundreds of companies that have spring, sprung up in very recent times that, that make money there. One of them is from my alma mater, two students two years ago from, from the Wharton School in a logistics class of all places, they came with the idea that, wow, you know, if we can, if we can offer consumers to buy their CO2 emissions voluntarily, uh, you know, then that's a business because there's a lot of consciousness going around there. And so they started doing this, and the, the, the company is called Terrapass.com. And in the shortest period of time, they were selling for $49. My, I have an old Volvo, $49 a year for my average driving uh, will in fact take the CO2 emissions back into plantations that they build and uh, alternative energy. So the thesis of my talk here today is that serving both the ecos is an extremely good entrepreneurial idea. It's an extremely good uh, entrepreneurial idea. And you look for all, for all your examples there. Um, when Ben & Jerry's was bought by Unilever, Unilever is one of the companies that I do a lot of seminar work with. They're the largest food company in, one of the largest food companies in the world, and they're worrying. They're going, they're thinking forward, and they're saying, what are we going to do? Um, we're serving two billion people. The other four billion, most of them don't have enough mu uh, food. So they're saying, that's not possible, because, you know, w what is our role as a company in doing that. It's not about giving food away, but how can we create value chains that will also help us grow with that growing dilemma? Um, so very sound forward thinking kind of uh, things. When they bought Ben and Jerry's, Ben Cohen, who writes a recommendation in the back of my book because he's a Vermonter like I am, although I was born in the Netherlands, I call myself a Vermonter. And um, Ben said, okay, we'll, we'll sell it to you, but under the condition that you have to absolutely adhere to our value statement, our mission statement. And you can't believe how happy Unilever is with this because it gives them an excuse, a new business model. They build a factory just like that in Europe now, like the one in Vermont. They're doing the same thing. They're selling ice cream with messages on the, on the cans and that sort of thing, and people adore them. And I tell this story not because I, I don't eat that much ice cream, but uh, I, I, I tell this story because what you, what you now get is a value chain that starts with all the ingredients of the earth. So they buy milk from farmers that would otherwise go under, from small farmers. They, they specify the milk has to come from these small farmers. Some of it is organic, some of it isn't. 
and they use very nifty advertising techniques. So they have built a value chain with which an enormous number of customers are tremendously happy. And so they're serving ecology and economy at the same time, just like the guys at Therapass. And of course, as entrepreneurs and as humans, we always make mistake, mistakes. You know, some ventures will you know, make a mistake and then the press will roll over us and say, you know, you guys are just liars and cheaters like business people are always called. Some of them are. You know, some doctors are liars and cheaters. You know, some professors, are, some humans are liars and cheaters. What I loved about, about Joseph Campbell was that that's what he was preoccupied with. He was not preoccupied with the bottom line. He reversed it. He said, if you follow your bliss, you get your bottom line. And that bottom line is not only made up of, mo of dollars or euros. I like euro euros these days, very strong against the dollar. <laughs> Bring my savings over cash. I love that part. But, but bliss is made up of three types of values or many more than that. Uh, and one of them is money, and we, tr we, we equate money to, to basically uh, solving all our problems, you know. Uh, but if we don't solve this larger uh, challenge, but I, I, I want to talk about opportunities, opportunity of the two ecos drifting apart, if we don't solve that, then we have very little to hold on anymore. Because then we're going to end up in a situation where... Uh, there will be just too much illness. I once wrote a little paper about uh, seven, eight years ago, which I published, it was called uh, the, the, the Opportunities in New Venturing in a Cost-Externalizing Economy. What's a cost-externalizing economy? Can anybody explain this to us? Are we living in a cost-externalizing economy? Is pollution externalization? Yeah. So we're, we're living in a situation where in um, what we do is partially accounted for by profit loss statement and balance sheets and cash flows. And I should know this because I was a financial executive for decades. Uh, but there is a part that's not being accounted for. Where does that go? It ends up in the morning when I come out of my little cute cottage in Venice on the, on the beach there and I see these huge dust clouds coming over me. Who pays for that? Uh, there, is a, there is a correlation now in the, the, the World Health Organization has a statistic which they started uh, maybe 20 years ago. And for the first time in the history of man, we can correlate health with health of the planet. Isn't that amazing? So y what you will see there is that hormonally related cancers are skyrocketing in countries with industrial pollution and not in the other countries. Women who migrate from Japan to San Francisco, Japan has a much lower rate of breast cancer than the, U th than the US has. Within five years, they have the same mortality rate. So, you know, when I talk to executives, I usually start off by saying, I'm going to tell you that we're living in a crisis of perception, and then they're all quiet, you know, and then it's okay for a while, and then they say, he's another doomsdayer, and at the end of them, you know, they've seen the opportunities. But I didn't start that with you. What I would like to end on is by saying there is a tremendous opportunity in living your bliss, showing who you are to your clients, to your customers, to your family, and at the same time, taking care of your income, i.e., you know, going after, as an entrepreneur, going after uh, profit planet and people. And the way you do that is by building value chains where people will buy you not only your, because they like your price, because they also like your story. Joseph Campbell, live your bliss. So that's all I want to tell you. Oh, and... Talking about the money, that book is very expensive. I hope there's nobody that's here from Springer. But uh, the book that we published with these 60 stories is, very exp is a very expensive book. They set the price. Um, maybe if you all go on strike, they will lower the price, you know. 
consumers you know, do this. But uh, the other thing about the book was that it came to us that my research partner is both a psychologist and an economist. And she's very, very focused on the human behavioral aspects of what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur. So she and I work together well because I started three, four companies myself in my life. And so uh, it's, it's a very good book the, uh, in, in that sense. But what we also did is we, we, we fashioned it in itself as an entrepreneurial venture. So this book was written by us um, with, with very little compensation. We did about 75% of it for free and the royalties go to the foundation that supports our university. And that's a lovely entrepreneurial thing to do, as far as I'm concerned. The chancellor would like it if all his students wrote books and send the royalties to the university, wouldn't you? <laughs> so that's actually my little story. So I'm try trying to tell you a story rather than to uh, tell you what to do with it. Um, if you... Um, if you want some more information, you know, just find me on the web, um, and um, or or look up the little book and see where you can find me. Thank you very much. <laughs>